There are those who say that this is ordinary, but don't let that fool you. Mother will always be the bravest, least ordinary, most difficult, utterly challenging career that anyone ever hopes to lay claim to. While others might hear, diaper changer, food maker, laundry doer, carpooler, bottle washer, sweatpants wear, life on hold, want to be doing anything else, woman. The truth is, whether it feels like it some days or not, you are in fact a shelter from the storm. You are a cape of good hope. You are a warrior who will do battle for your children's hearts, souls, attention, innocence, education, and memories. Go to battle, my friends. This is your time. We will hold strong on either side of you. We will pray for those bottles through the dark watches of the night. And when doubt comes and children break, when adults fail them, and when they push and push as hard against us as the day we deliver them into this world, we will not be broken. We may ache and see cracks tear through our hearts but we will get up again tomorrow and we will load the clothes and the words that need to be said again and again and again. And when the world tries to claw at them, to break them, to smash the beauty in them, may our walls hold true. May the lessons we've told the truths we've lived, the life we've spoken into them come back easily, predictably, with wash and repeat ease. Kingdom business, Jesus work, this shaping of souls, this raising tiny humans. There are those that say this is ordinary. Don't buy it for a second. Mighty. You are mighty because you, Mother. Obviously, we're speaking about the mighty mother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that we can be in your house this morning, that we can celebrate mothers today. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us such a privilege of having mothers. I pray right now, Lord, that you would speak through me to each heart this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Become a mom, they said. It'll be fun, they said. How many of you have ever seen this image? It's coming. coming. (laughs) Ever feel like that? Yeah. <laughs> you got one in the fridge, one on the floor. There's mud somewhere. I don't even know if it's mud, but we're, we're going to say it is. Is it me? Okay. So I want to open with a story that I've seen, and some of you may have heard it on um, social media uh, recently. It's called Dear Less Than Perfect Mom. Dear Less Than Perfect Mom, I've seen you around. I've seen you screaming at your kids in public. I've seen you ignoring them at the playground. I've seen you unshowered, wearing last night's pajamas at the preschool drop-off. I've seen you begging with your children, bribing them and threatening them. I've seen you shout back and forth with your husband, with your mom, and with a police officer now in the crosswalk. I've seen you running around with your kids, and literally around your kids, getting dirty and occasionally swearing audibly with a bang when you bang your knee. 
I've seen you sharing a milkshake with a maniac four-year-old, wiping your kid's snot on the bare palm of your hand and then smearing them on the back of your blue jeans. I've seen you carry your flip-flop toddler over the crook of your arm while you're chasing the runaway ball. I've seen you gritting your teeth while your kids are screaming at you for making them practice the piano or soccer or basking weave it or whatever it is you feel they need to do. I've seen you close your eyes and breathe slowly, finding a gallon of dumped milk, gallon of dumped milk into the trunk of your car. We've been there. <laughs> I've seen you crying at the sink when you're desperately trying to scrub the crayon off your best designer purse. I've seen you pacing the front of your house. I've seen you at the hospital waiting room, at the pharmacy counter, looking exhausted, tired, frightened, and all the emotions that come with those situations. I've actually seen you a lot. I see you every day. I don't know if you plan to be a parent or not, if you knew from your early years that you wanted children to bring them in the world, or if motherhood was thrust upon you. I don't know if it meets your expectations, or if you spent the first days as a mom absolutely terrified that you wouldn't know what the motherly love for your child would feel like. I don't know if you struggle with pregnancy loss, traumatic births, or infertility. I don't know if you created your child or created your family by welcoming a child into it. But I do know a lot about you. I know that you didn't always get what you wanted, but I know that you also got a wealth of things that you didn't want, and then you did want when they were in front of you. I know that you don't believe that you're doing your best, and you think you can do better, but I also know that you're doing better than you think. I know that when you look at your child or your children, you see yourself, and I know that you don't see a... I know that you don't, that a stranger can see them, and the small important things that seem to bother you and your child also resemble you. I know that you want to throw a lamp at your teenager's head or toss your three-year-old out the window once in a while. I know there's some nice... (laughs) I know there's some nights when it's finally quiet that you curl up in bed and cry, and I know sometimes you don't cry even though you want to. I know some days are hard and all you want for them is to be over and at bedtime you hug and kiss your child and tell them how much you love them and want them to be like you when you grow up and wish the day could last forever, but it never does. A day always ends and the next day brings new challenges. There's fever and heartbreaks and art projects and new friends, new pets, new fights, and every day you do what you need to do. It's because you take care of things because it's your job. You go to work, you fill up the crock pot, you climb into the garden, you strap a baby to your back and you pull out the vacuum cleaner. You drop everything you're doing to moderate an argument over whose turn it is for a specifically colored marker, or you kiss a boo-boo or have a conversation about which lipstick Pinocchio's mommy wears. I know that you have tickle fights and blanket forts, and I know that you have, you know all the words to at least eight different picture books. I know that you dance like a wild woman in front of your kids, and you only do it in front of them. And you have no shame about certain noises that you make in the presence of your children. You make up goofy songs and you play with them past bedtime. And you drop everything you're doing at bedtime to go and trim the fingernail of your three-year-old that insists is keeping them up. I know that you stop cleaning your dishes because your children enjoy, insist that you join their tea party. I know that you fed your children four, four days of peanut butter and jelly when you had the flu. I know that you eat the leftover crusts over the sink, hoping that they don't catch you while they're watching Super Y. I know you didn't expect all of this, but I also know... You didn't anticipate loving somebody so intensely or even loathing at your post-baby body or being so tired, but you're a great mom that you've turned out to be. You thought you had it figured out. You hired the perfect nanny or or you would quit your job, and you learned how to assemble flat-packaged baby furniture. You get confused by the feeling like nothing nothing has changed since you were free, but you look back at the choices, and you feel that sometimes there's an imposter in your skin. You're not the perfect mom. No matter how hard you try, no matter what you do, you never will be. And maybe that haunts you, but maybe you've made peace with it. No matter how much you do, there is always more. No matter how little you do, when the day is over, your children are loved. They smile at you, believing you have the magical powers to fix anything and everything. And no matter what happened at work or school or play group, you've still done everything possible that will bring your children the next morning. They're happy, healthy, and learning to be wise. Unfortunately, there is no perfect mother. Kids will grow up to be determined to be different than you. They will grow up a certain way that they will never make their children take piano lessons, or I swear I'll be more lenient than you ever were, or they'll be more strict, or they'll have less kids or more kids, or have none at all. No matter how far from perfect you are, you're better than you think. Someday your kids are going to be running around crazy at church, and people are going to 
people are going to look over and tell you what a beautiful family that you have. You'll be at the park and your kids will be covered in mud and jam up to their elbows and a cute little pregnant woman will stop by and smile wistfully. No matter how many doubts you may have, no ma- never, never doubt this one thing. You may not be the perfect mother, but that's good because really your child isn't perfect. And that means nobody can care for them the way that you do. They can't determine what their squeal or cry is about or what their jokes mean or why they're crying better than you can. And since no mother is perfect, chances are you're caught in a two-way billion tie for the best mom in the world. So congratulations, best mom in the world. I thought this was a cute little story, you know, because moms, you think about all the day-to-day stuff. And this is just one mom's blog post. I think she was having a bad day. (laughs) And you think about all the stuff you go through as a mom. And then you think about all the stuff you go through as your children are grown. How many of you feel today that you had the perfect mother? That you were raised by the perfect mother? (laughs) Some of y'all are lying. Mothers are very special. They are. And some of us may believe that our mothers were perfect. Abraham Lincoln said, All that I am or hope to be, I owe to my angel mother. I remember my mother's prayers, and they have always followed me. They have clung to me all my life. The moms that sit and pray and pray and pray for their children really have something special. George Washington said this of his mother, My mother was the most beautiful woman I ever saw. All I am I owe to my mother. I attribute all my success in life to be moral, intellectual, and physical education I received from her. So two of our presidents just adored their mothers and how they were raised. We also know in Proverbs 31 you see the description of a mother and how precious that is. But today I don't want to talk about Proverbs. I want to go back to a different example in the, in the scriptures of a near-perfect mother and a mother who is seen in the book of Ruth. A mother who will be the spotlight this morning is Naomi. From Naomi, we can look at a mother's strength and her love for her children, for she was a mighty woman. Now, the first point is a mother's amazing inner strength. In Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In these days, when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem and Judah left his home and went to the country of Moab, taking his wife and his two sons. The man's name was The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Their two sons, Malin and Kilian, they were, they were, Euphrates from. Hopefully, I didn't say that wrong. From Bethlehem in the land of Judah, when they reached Moab, they settled there. Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. Then the two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpha, and the other married a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both the sons had died. This left Naomi alone with her, without her two sons and her husband. So you see in these verses, we're introduced to a very special woman named Naomi. She had her husband. She had her two sons. They moved where there was plenty of food and good land, and they lived there for a number of years. However, you see that in her life, tragedy interrupted all this positive that was going on. Naomi's husband died for some reason. We don't know the reasons. And she was left with her two sons to fend for themselves. And I can't imagine the pain that she had felt or the bewilderment of not knowing how she was going to care for her, her sons and how they were going to survive. She lost her husband, her closest friend, and her provider. There are women today in this room that have suffered the loss of a husband and can identify with this kind of pain. But the scripture doesn't even t- mention that Naomi grieved. It only shows that she went on with life and raised her sons until they were able to take their own wives. And then tragedy strikes again in verse 5 with the death of both her sons. Again, Naomi was left with no one to provide. Now she had two daughters-in-law to care for. Just as Naomi thought her purpose in life was served, she had to start over from scratch. She had to play the part of mother all over again. There was no indication at this point that she felt any resentment about this. She just carried on and did what she needed to do. We see here the demonstration of a mother's strength. The text shows that there was no grief shown. It only reveals that she bore her pain and went on with it. We see this strength in a mother all the time. Mothers are expected to do so much these days. They work full-time jobs. 
They care for their children, whether it's taking them here or there or sports or wherever they go. And they juggle all these things while they're supposed to be full-time homemakers at the same time and have the perfect meal on the dinner table that everybody's going to love and nobody's going to scream about and sit there and pout until 10 o'clock at night because we've been there. (coughs) Mothers are supposed to handle all these tasks every day and prove that they're mighty, that they got it, right? Naomi just picked up and did what she needed to do. She had this inner strength that just sustained her just like some of the moms in this room. A mother's strength is a mystery to us. It's such a mystery that an old Jewish proverb says, God could not be everywhere, therefore he made mothers. Mark Twain describes a mother as having a large heart, a heart so large that everybody's grief and everybody's joy found welcome in it, and and it was a hospitable accommodation for them all. Number two, a mother's concern for her children You go down to verse 6. Then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed the people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave and return to their homeland. With her two daughters-in-law, she set forth for the place that she she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. On the way, Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's homes. May the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and also to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. And she kissed them goodbye, and and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why would you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who would grow up and be your husbands? No, daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? Of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than it is for you, because the Lord has raised a fist, his fist against me. And again they wept. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law and waved goodbye, or said goodbye. And Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. We see here that Naomi was concerned for the happiness. How many times do you see a mother put the concerns of her children before her own? Every day. Every day. She gets up all hours in the night. doesn't matter what time it is. Somebody's crying. Somebody threw up in bed. Something happened. You know, there's a, a, oh, gosh. Joseph swore one night that there was a spider under his blanket. I mean, we're searching the sheets. You pull every blanket off. You're looking for this spider, okay? I think he just dreamt it. Nothing was in that child's bed except Spider-Man. So, (laughs) you know, who knows? (laughs) Could have been Spider-Man. I don't know. But you put the concerns because all, everything else stops because their concern is far more important whether you not. You get a good night's sleep, doesn't matter anymore because they're upset or they need something or you need to do this or that, right? Even parents that have adult children go through this. You know, the concern of their child is still more important to them than what's going on at that particular moment in their life. You never stop being a parent. It doesn't matter how old your children are. See, Naomi was concerned about the happiness of her daughters-in-law. And in verse 8, she kept telling them, go back, go back. I can't provide for you. I can't be there emotionally for you. You need to go have another husband. She wanted them to see that their well-being was most important. Go back home, find a new husband. Be more, she was more concerned about them than herself. Naomi was willing to, sell, to sacrifice her only source of companionship, these two young women, so that they could be happy in life. And she would give up her own happiness just for theirs. Isn't it typical of a mother to give up things for their own children every day? There's a story from Focus on the Family concerning the sacrifice of a mother. Focus on the Family wrote this article. There was a 36-year-old mother that discovered to be in the advanced stages of terminal cancer. One doctor advised her to spend her remaining days enjoying herself on a beach, while the second physician offered her the hope of living two to four years with the grueling side effects of chemotherapy and radiation. So she penned these words to her three small children. I've chosen to try to survive for you. This may have horrible costs, including pain, loss of my good sense of humor, 
and moods that I will not be able to control. But I have to try this if this is the only chance I might live one moment longer. And in that one minute longer, that you might need me when no one else can do what I can do. For this, I intend to struggle tooth and nail, and I'm praying for God's help. Oftentimes, a mother will give up her own happiness, her own health, everything that she is. But in the eyes of a mother, it's not really sacrificing her happiness. Her greatest joy is when she sees her children's needs being met and when they light up in the room because she's there for them no matter what. Every day, a mother shows they're a little more mighty by putting the needs and concerns of their children before her own. Every day. So in Ruth 1, 15 through 18, you see one of those crazy mother tricks. In verse 15, you start there. It says, look, Naomi said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, do not ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. One of the daughters took the advice and left, right? But Ruth, on the other hand, refused to listen to her. She was determined to stay right here with her. And see, you see these little tactics that moms have and they use in attempting to make their children have, make the right decision, make a good decision, in order to prod them along in the right direction or what we feel the right direction is. A mother say, might say, for example, all right, if you don't accept my advice, don't expect to hear any more from me. But mothers have a way with their words. They know exactly what to say in order to just to prod and prick at their child's conscience. I guess you could call this a form of verbal discipline. A parent who loves, to, who loves their child will discipline them for their own good. Naomi showed her love and concern for Ruth when she tried to persuade her to go back home. But Naomi realized that Ruth wasn't going to hear it. Ruth had made a choice to be there. Even though she tried that little crazy mom trick and tried to persuade her differently, it wasn't working this time. And number four, a mother may not be superwoman, but a mother is mighty. So the two of them continued on their journey. When they came to Bethlehem, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is it really, is it really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara. For the Lord Almighty has made me very, very bitter has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? So she comes into town, right? When most people would be excited to see family and excited to rejoin, you know, after years of not being with family and friends. And she she looks at him and says, don't call me Naomi, I'm bitter. She gets this attitude now, right? After proving that she has the strength to go on and and doing what's right for her daughters-in-law. And then the name Mara in Hebrew literally means bitter. Naomi was bitter inside. Nevertheless, she only thought about helping her daughters-in-law and putting them first. We saw that there was no mention of Naomi being grieved or upset about what happened to her sons and her husband. She appeared to go on with life even though tragedy had come upon her so suddenly. And we see once again the great mysteries of a mother. That a mother appears to be superwoman without a care in the world for herself. But it's not true. We can't do it all. We can't fly. Okay? Although that would be awesome because there have been times where you think you need to be superwoman because your son's supermaned off the back deck rail. You're seeing him fly through the air and you're going, and there's no way you can get there from the garden. But he landed it, so we're good. (laughs) Scary, you know? You want to be everywhere you can to protect them and love them. But sometimes, Mom, you have to realize you're not superwoman. And you're not supposed to be. Oliver Wendell Holmes said this, Youth fades, love droops, and leaves the friendship fall. A mother's secret hope outlives them all. Mothers have needs, too. We need to realize this fact. 
that sometimes they suppress their feelings in order not to bother their children or their husbands, that they sort of possess this secret strength, their secret hope, as Holmes called it. We need to recognize that we need to take care of our mothers, even if they do tuck away those emotions, that we need to find out their needs and treat them with loving care. Because just like all the children in the world need a mother to care for them, moms need someone to wrap an arm around them and know that it's okay that you're not superwoman. It's okay that you can't do it all, that you can't go flying and catch the kid that's leaping off the top bunk bed. Okay? Again, Joseph. My son's three, what can I say? And you've been there, you know? You can't do it all. You can try to cook the perfect meal and say, yes, they're going to eat kale tonight. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Good luck. It isn't going to happen. What is that? Is it supposed to be that color? Yes, just eat it. I have one child that will eat the entire stalk of broccoli. I have another child that looks at it and goes, really? We're supposed to eat that? That's dinner? Yes. And you're going to love it (laughs) while they're rolling their eyes, you know. You're not superwoman. You're not going to please everybody all the time. That's not your job. Your job is to train that child up in God's word. Your job is to love them and nurture them and paddle them every once in a while because sometimes they need it. And while you're crying, while you're spanking their bottom, it's all right. It's all right. That's why you're not superwoman. I think I cry harder than the kids do when I've paddled them. Because I feel so terrible about it, but I know it's for their own good. You're not superwoman, but you are mighty. And some of you moms have grown children, and you've recognized they'll call you, Mom, I don't know what to do. I'm stuck. This situation is horrible. And you're crying over the phone going, I don't know what to tell you, but I'll touch you and hug you and love you anyways. Because a mom never, never stops mothering. Never. Even if your mom's in heaven, you remember the things that she taught you growing up. Those little things that she says. You know, it's one of those mom tricks. They say something, and it sticks with you the rest of your life. Right? There's something special that a mom's hold. And some of us have experienced in life loss. And some of us in this room, there are others that don't even know that you were ever a mother. And it's such a precious bond that a mother has the instant she finds out that she's got that baby in her tummy or the instant you become a parent through adoption. It's this overwhelming strength that comes over you that you are going to protect that child at all costs. Even if you can't, even if the Lord takes that child home, you're still a mother and you were still mighty and superwoman to that child. You did everything in your power to protect and love and be concerned for their needs. It's so important to recognize who you are and recognize that God used you in a special way, even if you don't see the outcome you wanted to. This morning, moms, you are mighty. I want to just show this one last video. Mommy's here. Oh, my sweet boy. Do you have any idea what time it is? Can you say mama? Mama? Mama. Daddy. And a boy. Open big wide for Mama. What a big boy you are. What a big boy you are. <laughs> okay. Now we can't go to church with jelly all over our face, can we? Hmm? Oh my, oh my goodness. What are you doing with that snake? You go put that snake back in the hole right now. Oh, good buddy. Yeah. Way to go. All right, buddy. Hey. Oh, oh buddy. You okay? You all right? Come here. Oh, it's 
It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord. Hey, Mom. Mommy needs just a minute. Please. Hey, Mom. I think you look pretty no matter what. Even when your hair looks really weird. Oh, Mom! Go straight there. And come right back. Hold here, honey! Oh, Mom's oh, here! God. It's okay! Oh, you're okay! Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. oh. Mom, Wait. stop it. Mom? Dad? I asked Beth to marry me. Well, what'd she say? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the family. Hey, Mom. Where's that grandbaby? Where's oh, you? Nice to see you. Oh, yeah, nice to see you too. Grandma? Oh, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You did great. What's that? The children. You did really great. I always knew you'd be a good dad, but you did really, really great. Hey, Mom, what are you doing? <laughs> of course you are. Come sit with me. You know, I was thinking just the other day, about what a wonderful mom you are. I mean, God, God really blessed me with a great lady. You're, you're my mom. You've always been there for me. <laughs> Even when I didn't want you to be. <laughs> and nobody ever believed in me like you do. Thank you. I love you, Mom. And I love you, son. the impact sometimes that you're making on your children and how special you are in their lives. Sometimes the day just ends and you're thankful that it's over. But the next day starts and there's new challenges. And I want you to remember that while you may not be superwoman, you are mighty because God gives you an amazing strength, a strength to go on each day just like Naomi did. And raise up and be the mother that he's called you to be. We love you, moms. Thank you for carrying on each day with the peanut butter and jelly and the spilled milk. Okay. The macaroni and cheese that they insist on having and never eating. 
Thank you for raising us and turning us into these wonderful human beings that are now raising their own families. And thank you for being grandmothers, too, and aunts and uncles. In all the roles that you take on, we appreciate you, and we applaud you this morning. And I want to try something a little different. If you're a mother, stay seated, and the rest of you need to give them a standing ovation this morning because they are worth it. Amazing moms. And we love you too, dads. Your day's coming. This morning, as you depart, I want you to just enjoy your day and know they do not have to share this treat, okay? This week, I um, made homemade fudge. And don't leave it in a warm car, put it in the refrigerator. It, it was a little on the soft side. I had extra help that. It's a long story. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but there's, there's a little slice of heaven in the foyer that you can enjoy. And um, those of you that have sugar issues, please take caution. It is loaded. And so just you know what to do. But I want you to enjoy your Mother's Day this, this afternoon and Enjoy yourselves. And I'm going to ask Pastor to come and just pray over our mothers before they depart. It's all right. I'm feeling so blessed right now. Um, if you're sitting next to a mother, would you just grab her real tight? Come on, let's, let's get them get them real snuggled in. There we go. There we go. Yep, if you need to move somewhere else, you can. I know some of your moms are seated somewhere else. Yep. All righty. Father, we're so thankful this morning for moms. God, it's such an incredible privilege that we have to have these women in our life, the silent heroes of our day, or rarely get the recognition that they deserve, rarely get the praise that they deserve, rarely get the honor that they deserve, but they in silence and in secret work so hard and give themselves every day. Their sacrifice is so incredible to me. Lord, to witness it in my own home growing up and to witness it in the home that I live in now, a mother who selflessly every single day offers a sacrifice, commitment, real love. A mother is so critical in value to us in our day. You even chose to bring your son in through a mother. You knew that he could be entrusted to her so honored and privileged. I pray, God, this morning that you would bless them in mighty ways, Lord, as they every day continue on, as they every day do what they do, as they let instinct take over, as they read the word and pray and trust in you and lean on you for support, God, I pray that you would give them answers, wisdom, And as they are diligent, even in the moments of failure, I pray, God, that great success would result from their willingness and sacrifice. I pray that we would recognize their overwhelming love. And Lord, I just feel the need to pray for moms this morning that perhaps will not meet their children till paradise or some of their children. I pray, God, that you would strengthen them. Lord, they're no less a mother than any other other mothers in here. I pray that they would feel encouraged today, that they would feel loved today. And I pray, God, that we would be diligent to thank them, to love them, to appreciate them, to honor them, not just on a single Sunday in a year, but every day. 
that our lips would be filled with their praises, that we would honor them for their sacrifice. Lord, bless them in magnificent ways today. If you're in agreement, just say amen. Amen. Moms, have an awesome day.